Hey everyone! Last week, during Unreal Fest Online, we released two new Blender add-ons that greatly streamlined the workflow between Blender and Unreal Engine. The Send to Unreal add-on improves the export pipeline, while UE to Rigify allows you to import any characters from Unreal Engine and have access to Rigify animation controls. This allows you to more easily animate quad and bipedal characters. Visit our GitHub page to access the add-ons, documentation, and quick start videos. Real-time production is revolutionizing film and television pipelines across the globe. Whether it's virtual production techniques that empower filmmakers to explore ever more ambitious ideas, or final frame animations rendered in real-time for episodic TV and commercials, the way we create linear media content is changing. To help these storytellers extend their skill sets and embrace this brave new world, Epic Games is launching the Unreal Fellowship, a 30-day intensive online workshop during which experienced industry professionals can learn Unreal Engine, master state-of-the-art virtual production tools, and develop the skills to build teams proficient in the emerging field of real-time production. Apply now through July 27th. When the Royal Horticultural Society wanted to see its 30 million Bridgewater Garden project ahead of delivery, it called upon the University of Salford's Think Lab to create an immersive VR experience in Twinmotion. Learn more about the project and how Twinmotion can help propel the initial planning process on the Unreal Engine blog. When car giant Honda wanted to promote its new Civic hatchback, it partnered with the creators of the iconic anime series Evangelion Studio Kara to develop a string of distinctive commercials. Grafinica started full-scale production with almost no experience of Unreal Engine and delivered the project in less than three months. The Japanese animation studio is an expert in creating hybrid animations that make use of digital technology, mixing CG animation, compositing, and hand drawing. Learn more about how Unreal Engine's fast, real-time workflows were leveraged to hit their deadlines. It's time to share the top weekly karma earners on Answer Hub. Many thanks to Clockwork Ocean, Every Nun, Evil Cleric, Nape Jadam, Turer, Shadow River, Mighty Enigma, Andy C. Briggs, PFTQ, and Marcy. Our first community spotlight this week is on code a dystopian story-driven first-person shooter. Written and constructed almost entirely by one person, the game takes the player through a journey that explores conflicting ideologies within an open-world cyberpunk atmosphere. Go check it out on Steam. This real-time Niagara simulation from Epic senior technical artist Jonathan Lindquist is popping. It's using position-based dynamics and static volume textures to recreate the character's mesh, dynamically evaluated constraints, and simulation stages. Follow him on Twitter and check out the high-quality video on Vimeo. I Am Dead is a charming puzzle adventure game from the creators of Hohokum and Wilmot's Warehouse about exploring the afterlife. Maurice Lupton and the ghost of his dog Sparky must uncover ancient mysteries and save the place they call home. To help with their mission, Maurice uses his newfound power that allows him to peer inside objects and people to reveal their contents and memories. Published by Annapurna Interactive, the game will be released later this year, so make sure you wishlist it on Steam. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and today my guest is none other than Mr. Chance Ivy. Hey, how's it going? Long time no see. It's great to see um, some familiar faces here in chat and uh, a bunch of new folks as well. Yeah, you you know, you're, I would call you a stream veteran. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Back then we were just trying to figure out you know, how to do all this stuff and how it works. It seems that you guys have taken it to um, quite the next level. And I'm just excited to be back. I think it's been, what, like three years now, two years since I've uh, since I've been on Inside Unreal. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. I'm happy to be here today. I'm glad you're here. Today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to your heart, uh, the <coughs> UDC example plugin, or sorry, the simple UDC plugin. That's right. Yeah, so um, we're going uh, I guess a couple weeks ago, Victor, you helped me with this quite a bit, but um, I've been we had released a uh, an abstraction of the Robo Recall modding tech into a plugin and an uh, automation tool script. Um, so it's a little something that 
I had been kind of working on after hours for some time, just slowly starting to move um, some of the technology out. Um, I'll go kind of through some of our focus and, you know, some context as to what we did, um, what where you should look to, to um, you know, find some of this technology. And we'll be walking through a number of different things you can do with the project today. Um, it's a little different than I'm used to for like a, a, a demo because uh, I wasn't really sure which computer I would be streaming from today. So uh, I went through over the last couple of days and I made some videos of me walking through the entire presentation. So you're going to see me drop the presentation for a second, open a video, kind of scrub through it and pause and then talk about things. Um, so if you've got questions about those things, drop them in chat as normal. We'll try to get to what we can in the end here. Um, yeah, well, I guess without further ado, we can we can just dive right in. Yeah, let's do it. Victor, you tell me when my thing's on screen. It's on screen. It's on screen. Great. <clears throat> All right. So, boom, boom. so again, context in today's focus. Um, if you're not familiar, we released Robo Recall back in uh, 2017 for the Oculus platform. Um, it had a mod kit that launched on the that well launched on the launcher. Um, it supported player, enemy, and gun mods, so you could override those things inside the main game as well as loading all new content uh, as maps. So you could basically build a new maps to play Robo Recall on, or you could even do like some full conversion stuff there as well. Um, it supported all different kinds of content. Um, most of the runtime hooks were in actual replacement and in map discovery. Um, the editor and the source are available on the Epic Games launcher. So you can just go in there and find Robo Recall Mod Kit, download it, take a look at all we did there too. Um, it's built on an older version of Unreal. I think we shipped on 4.15, if I believe so, but um, you know, that's back in the day when we had engine releases, you know, much more regularly. And so there's probably a bit of mm -hmm. 14, bit of 13, bit of 15, and maybe even some future 16 stuff in there. So um, if you're trying to look at that as a, as a resource for now, you're going to find some really great things conceptually and some of the, the ways we built both the game and some of the modding capabilities. Um, but a lot of that code doesn't necessarily translate straight up to your project um, now. So hence, the next step here is uh, the simple UGC plugin automation tool scripts. So this is a plugin that has a runtime and it has a editor module inside of it that helps with UGC uh, content discovery, actor override functionality, and utilities for packaging and creation, just like we had in Robo Recall. It's 425.1 uh, compatible. Um, so if you, uh, if you have 425, you'll want to upgrade to 425.1 to use it. Um, it'll also, you know, we'll have it in the next version of the engine as well, too. Which went live the, today. Uh, yes, exactly. I saw. Um, and then also there's a really simple UGC example project that uses this technology in a way that, um, you know, that shows like the entire modding end to end, uh, architecture, how individual pieces work. And so it's like really a bare bones example. We're going to walk through the project here. I'm actually going to run the executable and you're going to see the riveting gameplay that is there. Um, Victor's seen this. He's really excited to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, let's just show basic uh, mod support for UE4. And the project itself is, is wholly available on GitHub as well, uh, along with some light documentation. Um, and you know, you can go on there, do pull requests if you want to. You can fork it. You can uh, flag some issues for me to take a look at if you, if you come across anything. But um, surface area isn't su uh, super broad, uh, so there's not a ton of stuff in there. But the point is, is I wanted to get something out that was really simple. And we'll get to that in just a second. So a lot of people will ask me, um, since the Robo Recall days, like, hey, I want to add mod support, or they don't ask, I say, I want to add mod support to my game, and my first question back to them is, like, what does that mean to you, right? Like, um, you know, it can go as simple as, like, overriding a texture, right? Like, replacing uh, the skins for your weapons to something else, all the way to a full conversion, and so kind of thinking through this, there's really three major different pillars that I like, or like, I guess not pillars, but approaches that I like to to, to think through here. And one of them is I want to play the main game like as it was designed and as it was built, um, but I want to override some of the base functionality. And so this would be something like, you know, you'd see in Skyrim mods where like all the dragons or butterflies or whatnot, you know, those kinds of things. Or um, maybe there's a goop gun that has alternative fire. Or maybe you've overridden the enemies so they can be, you know, turned into being on your team to fight other people just in certain areas. You know, maybe there's something that, that some mechanism lets you do that. And then there's ways to like augment based systems. So this would be like, say you have a, a system that has like a uh, a merchant, right? And you wanted to, you're a sword builder and you want to build a thousand swords um, that work with this game. And you want those to be available for some with some currency, right? Like inside that main game. Uh, so people would still be playing that core game, but now they have new stuff, uh, systems that scale up and down based on 
content that was created kind of out of band from that original project, right? Uh, or like same thing like hats, right? Like the whole game plays the same, but maybe there's a bunch of you know community built hats that are passed around, and they, now they can go on your characters, and it doesn't really change a lot of gameplay. It's just augmenting the experience that's there. Um, and then all the way over to like adding new content, like so, say you had like you know a squad based shooter game, and now you wanted to do one where it's a little bit less. Um, uh, perfectly balanced. You wanted to have like you know protect the president mode, where there's a, you know somebody with a completely different model that is obviously um, the president. He's made of glass, or she's made of glass. And then you have the other people there that are like the secret service agents that are really good, right? Um, and that would probably use some of the same core systems as the main game, but it's all brand new content. It's completely different ways to play. Um, or say you have like a dungeon crawler game, right? Like, and it's really great. It's set in like, you know, like a high fantasy world, but you want to take those people to space, right? And so you might have space themes maps with different enemies and whatnot. And this goes all the way to like full conversion mods. So <clears throat> kind of abstractly what you'd be looking at here and the way that I think about this the way that we thought about it for Robo Recall was like, at an abstract level, mods are just really bundles of content for a game that are created and packaged and distributed separately from that game, right? Um, there can be integrations into main systems, or you can pop out of those main systems and main frameworks into a mod to play it separately. But when you start thinking about it, we start thinking about it this way. It kind of separates some of the the technology pieces from the design implementation. And one of those is very content specific and game specific, uh, like as to what your game might need. And the other one is more about like, okay, how do I structure my content to get it into those right places? Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with with mod tools. Um, I've had a couple people reach out beforehand since we launched the project and say, hey, I've never even looked at modding. I'm not really sure what goes into it at all. Um, so this might be a little bit obvious to some folks, but I wanted to call it out here. So some of the tools you would probably use here is like your editor internally, right? This might be your version of 425, or you've got some you know fork of, of GitHub that you've kind of built yourself. A lot of studios will have that. You know, It's like the for instance, we had the Robo Recall editor, right? Or like the Fortnite editor. And that's the thing that we use to build that game. That thing outputs like an executable a package that is playable, right? It's distributable and it can be played. Um, from that editor can be created a mod editor, which may or may not have all the same content in it. Um, it may have extra or less functionality because it's for a different user. Um, instead of this being the entire same thing that you would build your game with. The intent here is to build these little packs of content uh, that can be consumed by that main game and load it up separately, right? Um, for Robo Recall, we released like you know the entire editor plus the two buttons you've seen there for creating and packaging, and um, we removed like things like the maps, right? So people couldn't play the whole game, but they had everything they needed inside the entire architecture to be able to. Uh, to be able to go through and test out a mod. So they could build a mod, play a simple sample level, like say they're making a new gun, they could play it against a new enemy, or they play it against an old enemy, or play a new enemy with the old guns and vice versa, right? Or they can make their own maps and play them there. The rest of the infrastructure was there. Um, some people, we have some mod kits on the launcher right now um, that have uh, full on, like they, they basically are, their custom mod kit is really vanilla UE with their project in it. And they're maintaining it separately than vanilla UE since we release, you know, out of band from them. But, you know, they release everything inside of there. So it's almost like the old UT model where you can get at pretty much any of our code, uh, it, anything that's, you know, uh, that, that, that comes with the editor. It's all of our Unreal scripts, all of our content, everything that's in there. And you can kind of recreate your own mods there. And then there are some other folks, too, that have built ways to limit a lot of the content, ship only the, the minimal amount of stuff that needs to go in there, and then have some other tools that can kind of fill in the gaps to protect some of that IP. A lot of those processes are going to be very custom to your need um, and what, you, what you're comfortable with releasing. Um, and there are ways, too, that some folks have actually been able to take content that they want to be able to ship for modders to use, but they've cooked it and then had the editor load the cooked version so it can't be easily you know, distributed outside of the editor. So for this project itself, I um, wanted to kind of let you guys know and gals know what the um, focus was for me whenever I was taking this approach. You know, it's it's called the simple UGC plugin for a reason. It's really, it's not, bare bones is kind of, a, it's hard to say, or is, is maybe too hard to say, harsh to say for the plugin itself, but 
we really want to just take the mod support code out of Ro Robo Recall and pluginize it as a start and kind of show all the individual moving pieces and then kind of scale up from there too. We know that you're going to have very different modding um, needs based on where you're publishing or what kind of mods you want in your game. And so it'd be a little presumptuous of us to make a lot of those decisions for you. And we know that specifically for this, as we've worked with licensees that are doing this, there's really not one size fits all solution for any of it. So, um, so the first thing was, is can we pull that code out of Robo Recall? So you don't have to download Robo Recall, you know, do some research there and then deduce what you need and then try to port that code up into UE4 or 25, right? Um, and then do it in a way too that doesn't require engine code, right? So I was, can I add mod support using that plugin without changing the engine? And there's some trade-offs without changing the engine here, but this is a this is definitely enough to get moving. Um, there's a lot more sophistication you can get into the lower level you go, as I'm sure everyone's aware here, but uh, using the UGC example, as, a, as like a template to work from and the simple UGC plugin here. Um, you do have to have a source project because we need to recompile the automation tool for some custom build scripts that you'll want to modify just to get exactly what you want. Um, but you don't have to change the Unreal Engine code itself. Um, and then too, like just saying, okay, well, can I take like a mostly empty game and then sideload an entirely separate game? Um, one thing that was like interesting to me is like, well, what if I just ship like the starter content map and then there's like a just a menu that lets me l load up an entire kart racing game. And then from that kart racing game, I can load up an entire first person shooter game. Is that possible? Can I do that? And then um, in form to share, you know, in, in, in the form that we follow to share with you guys uh, as much as we can. Um, I wanted to make this as, as simple as possible. So there's really nothing in there that you're fighting trying to figure out how it works. And this goes to content too. Like you'll see, there's not a whole lot of content in this project at all. It's mostly just um, some editor code and if, a few little things that help you understand um, the relationships between them. Which made it hard to actually uh, to promote this thing too, because you know it's a bunch of editor pieces, a bunch of ed a bunch of tech. But it's cool. It's really good stuff. Um, so as I'm sure you've seen before in the blog post, you can get the project on GitHub. I've probably said that a couple of times today too. Um, it's github.com slash epic game slash UGC example. Of course, you have to be logged in to see that. Inside this repo, you'll get the whole project itself. You'll get the simple UGC plugin. You can see it kind of there in plugin slash simple UGC. Um, the automation tool scripts are in there as well. Uh, there's actually a packaged game that we include also just so you can just run, uh, uh, extract that exe, or extract the zip, and then run the exe, and then use this project just compiled to build mods for it, which we'll walk through here in a little bit. And then there's some quick start documentation on there as well. It just sh should cover kind of at a high level each individual piece. It walks you through kind of what we're going to do today at a very like handheld way. I won't be reading the documentation today because as much as that sounds like a whole lot of fun for you and for me, um, I just. You know, I figure it might be better for you to, to do that without me. Um, and then I, uh, I'll, I'll even go further in depth on taking some of this stuff out and working it into your own project to add. All right, so let's actually take a look. As mentioned, I have videos, which is going to be an interesting experience here, but we'll see how it goes. So have patience with me. Um, so this is the actual editor itself. Uh, Victor, can you see this OK? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Great. OK, good. So I'm going to go ahead and run it, but you'll see I have just this, if I can get this to go away here, there's a UGC example content folder here. And then I've added starter content here just as part of the demonstration, uh, just to show you something here in a little bit, but that's less relevant for right now. There's just the UGC example content kind of in our sample form. This can be moved into your project if you want to. It won't move the plugin, but it'll get this content over there for you. Now it's got a handful of blueprints, some simple UI, just so we can show you how to discover and, and use mods. There's two maps. There's main menu map, and then there's example map. Main menu map, you'll see pops up here. If I hit play in editor, uh, it's just loading up one of these UI widgets that's got a list of the UGC packages that it found. And by the way, just so we're clear, I will probably interchange UGC and mod back and forth here. If you don't know, UGC stands for user generated uh, content. Um, it's it, it's not standard in the engine anywhere yet. We want to. I'd love to standardize on that. Um, and it's called separately other places too. So you, you'll hear me say one or the other, but I kind of mean the same thing. And then there's a jump out to open example map, right? So this is just going to open that other map that you have here, and that's kind of it. That's kind of the whole project, right? Uh, right we have this. Yeah, we have this spawned 
cube actor and this spawn sphere actor, right? And they're there on their game. So that's fun. And uh, like I said, I have a package version of it. Now, this is in, um, in the UGC example project root. You can go down and see it in releases. There is UGC example v1 and then package game.exe. So I've copied that here to my desktop just for um, you know just ease of use, convenience. And pop it open here, and I can run the game. And guess what? It's just as exciting. I have nothing, and I can open my example map. And yep, there it is. Applause, please. Send the Game of the Year awards my direction. Um, so yep, that's it. You'll see it's just the same, same experience, one to the other. Now let's go ahead and take a look at making a new mod for that packaged game. Uh, as mentioned, we've got a couple of editor widgets that are up here um, that are very similar to what you would see in Robo Recall. I moved them on the toolbar a little bit, but they kind of do the same thing here. One of them is for creating a new um, constant-only plugin that is going to drop into the mods directory uh, under your project. And uh, we can go ahead and do that here. So just click on it. <clears throat> now, this is extending the... And apologies for some of the weirdness with Windows. I had to record this at 720p just in case there's bad compression. So there's going to be some weirdness with that, too. I apologize. Um, but th what this is going to do is... It, it, this is very similar to the plugin browser that you've seen before. It actually follows the... Um, it, it, I think it subclasses the plugin wizard definition, which uses that and overrides a number of those different settings. Um, so you'll see in here too, I'll highlight it in a second, but it's going into where my project is and the UGC example and then into mods. And so I'm giving my mod a name. I think I just call it my cool mod because all I make are cool mods. Give it a name, give it my author description, and then it will go ahead and create it. Hooray. All right, and you'll see over here too, um, my cool mod now has its own top level directory in the, the uh, sidebar for the content browser. And it takes me automatically to that content folder, right? So you can see it right there. There's nothing in it right now. So base template is empty. Now let's go ahead and take a look at it if we, if we play an editor, right? So play an editor. There's nothing there. I don't really expect much to happen, but, but you'll see now I have slash my cool mod as a new section here, right? And it's actually making a new um, like package path all the way up to the top for anything that's inside of there. It's the same way as if you had content in a plugin. So if you're used to working with things like the asset registry or you know any kind of uh, game packages, instead of being slash game slash you know directory path to the object. Um, this would be slash my cool mod slash, right? Um, so we see that up here. There's nothing in it yet, so there's really not a whole lot we can do. But um, at least we know that it was created appropriately, and we can actually find it. If you were just to make a um, slash plugin that goes here, or just drop something else into slash mods, it wouldn't necessarily show up here. Uh, the actual creation button flips a couple settings to make sure that it's discoverable here. Cool. All right, so let me close that out. So now let's actually add something to it. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the starter content that I added here, and I'm going to move over that minimal default. There it is, minimal underscore default. We'll copy it down into my cool mods directory. There we go. Double click. Now we'll save it, rename it. Build the lighting. Right. So now we have that new map in there, right? We can close all this down just to keep it straight. If I pop back into my main menu here and I hit play, I go play an editor. So I've reopened the play and editor, or sorry, the main menu map that we load into. 
and now you can see that I filtered, I found a map in there, right? Um, if I hit open, it'll pop open. Yep, so there it is. My new level, hit open, and it takes me to, yay, the great chairs. Um, so it's not super surprising, right? Like, you added a new map, you have somebody to look for new maps, it finds new maps in the editor. Um, I wanted to take a look real quick at that mod menu that you saw right there. We won't go too deep into it, but I want to call out why it's kind of neat. Let me go back to where we were. Sorry for the scrubbing. <clears throat> so here, there is this folder inside. Gosh, I wish that was not there. Uh, so can I make this smaller? Will that go away? It won't. Perfect. Thanks, Windows. Um, there's a folder VLC in here. Installed? What's that? Do you have VLC installed? I don't. Uh, so right here, inside this UI folder under UGC example content, there's a mod menu widget and a bunch of still different like little cell widgets. Uh, this folder is also like wholly encapsulated, so you can move this into your project. It's just using some of the, it's just using some of the uh, functions from the UGC registry, and you can just drop this into your project, kind of like as a quick like debug if you'd like to. Uh, just put it in your main, your first map, add, add that mod menu to screen, change this out to the place you actually want to go. But that's a good way for you to test mods, even if you haven't really designed what a mod menu would look like, just to make sure that the relationship between old content and new content um, it works well, and you understand how, how it's gonna, you know, how it's gonna look in the game. All right, so I'm gonna pop down here to packaging and playing new content. Uh, so let's actually package up that mod now. I can click this button here on package UGC. And this drops down a list of those special mod packages that we've created. Um, if you had like 100 in here, you would have them all down there. I'm assuming that a lot of folks uh, will probably have more than one mod at a time, whether trying stuff out or maintaining things for people to play with. I know I did in Robo Recall. This list is always super long. Um, but you can click this, just a single drop down click, and it's kind of a one touch package operation. Asks you where to save it. I'm just going to put it on the desktop here. And this will go through and do all the cooking and archiving and everything of all the content that's inside that mod package. It's going to output it as a zip file. Um, you can change that in the code if you'd like, if you need it to be other format, right? Um, but you'll see right here, that's now my desktop, mycoolmod.zip. Let me go ahead and pop it open. And then inside my packaged game, if I can get it open, there we go. It's looking for, it's going to auto discover and auto mount anything that's found in this mods directory. So if I take this now and I put this in there, so it's just right there underneath, you know, next to your binaries. My cool mod is now in there. And if you take a look, it's just a, it's got a U plugin. It's got all the metadata in there. You can actually extend the metadata. So if you wanted a bunch of different information that's saved with this mod that you might want to grab at runtime and use, such as released version or um, support links and whatnot, um, you can do all that as well. Content, packs, Windows, no editor, and we have a .pack file all the way in there too. All right, don't want to close yet. Yeah, so now I can go back and run the actual game. And you'll see in that same list, in the cooked packaged game, that new mod is, is showing to be found and available. And I can pop open that map. And now I have brand new content that did not exist inside UGC example game that now does. So that's like our first like map mod, right? Like now I can play the game where the pawn doesn't move and nothing else happens. There's no mechanics, but I can play this new map. Hooray, right? <laughs> that's exciting stuff. All right. It's a, it's a core piece, right? Knowing that you can actually implement complete new maps, right? Yeah. It's, it's sort of the, the easiest way to get started, I'd say. Oh, definitely. And what's cool, interesting about a map too is like you can just put a bunch of junk in the map and what will happen is, is that that level will build a reference chain of other stuff it needs. So like, and a map can have its own game mode override, right? Mm -hmm. So just even this level, I could build like an entire other game right inside that little thing and then sideload that map and I would be playing that game. You know, you would just need good mechanisms to get back to your other menu to do something different that you would normally do. But yeah, that was the, for Robo Recall, that was the first thing we got working was getting a separate map and then having I'm a, the guy, the Robo Recall guy, I can move around on it. Um, 
So then same thing with removing too, right? Like uh, this is a r really simple video and I just have it in here. It was supposed to be part of the other one, but it got snipped. So I'm playing it separately. You can come in here and delete this uh, and then run the game. And of course it's gone, which is not surprising. Ta-da. All right, so let's drop that out. So now let's move one step past. Um, da, 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 here we go. Move one step past maps. And we're going to put a new actor in here as well. Um, if you've done the quick start already, I know some of you probably have. You've probably seen some of the things we're going to show right now. But I'm just going to make a new actor here. We're going to call it our little metal ball. Because I'm not a tech artist, but you're going to see some really great material editing work here. I promise. I didn't tag this as, you know, rendering, but I should have. You're going to see it. it's going to be amazing. So I'm just making this. I'm making a little sphere, make it a little bit smaller. Or we're going to simulate physics just so it can actually do something. Um, I'm going to make a new material here, too. A metal ball material. Lesson number one in the material editor. What's that? This would be lesson number one of using the yes. material editor. Yes. I'm making the greatest material ever. It's like a silver with a little bit of blue. It's pretty metallic, and it's just a little bit rough. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so let's see what we got here. I can't spell metal. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and put that into my level. Sorry for the random sound you might hear. I had a couple of these things running in the background at the same time. All right, just drop one in there just so we can see our actor doing something. And I'm too close to it. That's no fun. So let's move that ball back a little bit. That's more like it. That looks great. All right, so we can stop playing editor. Um, so yeah, that's fun, right? Well. What if we wanted to make that first um, sphere that we saw in the first scene actually be this sphere instead? So instead of just having this as a new actor and that separate map like you talked about, it's just this other content piece. We want to actually take that and override the main the main um, sphere inside the game. So uh, let's take a look right there. First off, what we did, and this is very similar. If you if you walk through the Robo Recall code, this is very similar to that. The very first thing we did is on our sphere actor. We have to tell it that it can be replaced. So um, this is kind of a mechanism for you to control specific things in your world that you want people to be able to override or not. Um, it's kind of nice to say, hey, the game just falls apart if you turn all these things into whatever. But there's going to be a number of different things. Again, it'll depend on how you design things. You could put this on your base actor and then have everything inherit from it. But what we do here is we add a, what's called a make replaceable actor component right here. and on that component, there is a field or a property called actor replacement, or it's an actor replacement section called compatible replacement. So what this does is it basically says, hey, I'm a sphere, but I want people to be able to override me, right? And a compatible replacement uh, exists there to make sure that whatever is trying to take its place um, is compatible with the rest of the code, right? So you might have something, a perfect example would be uh, in Robo Recall, we wanted to override the pistol with, you know, like a, a goop gun, something like that, right? Something you hold or a sword, right, even. And the pistol couldn't just be overridden with our metal ball because there are interfaces and stuff that are expecting a pistol and parts of the core game would just fall apart. So we had a, a superclass called Odin Gun that all of our guns kind of work from, and that was the interface in which we did all of our, you know, function calls, event, you know, subscription, um, you know, property settings and whatnot. So in that case, this compatible replacement was Odin Gun. So that way, only types of Odin Gun could try to replace this thing. It's kind of a safety thing. Uh, and for this, this is just a regular old actor that doesn't really do anything, so we're just going to say actor. Uh, so it's nothing special. So now we've marked this actor as replaceable. I think this video is over and it's just going too far. So there it is. Great. <clears throat> now we have to tell 
the metal ball that it's supposed to replace that actor. One thing that, and uh, I'll pause for a second. One of the reasons we did this, as opposed to having some separate uh, manifest that's trying to map these things together, was um, in VR we wanted to bring everything into uh, you know like runtime priority order, as opposed to you having to muck with things like uh, an any file or some other configuration data asset or whatnot. Um, so we wanted you to be able to say, I want to activate this mod and the classes that are supposed to override know what they're supposed to do. And the classes that are going to be overridden know that they know that it's okay to do that. So you're not having to do a lot of this one-to-one thing. You can just kind of one touch using the menus, just apply, apply overrides and the two pieces know what they're doing. Um, anyway, so we'll take a look here and to metal ball. And I have a component here that's similar, but it's just called replacement actor. So the other one says, hey, I'm making this replaceable. And this one's saying, hey, I'm making you a replacement. Um, and then there's like this actor classes to replace array in here. And this one's an array. It's not just like a one-to-one -one mapping because you might want to say, in Robo Recall, for instance, we had people that wanted to play only pistols. The entire game, every gun is a pistol. And that's what you have to deal with it, right? You don't get anything better. You don't get anything different. And so we wanted to say, okay, we'll just make, you know, Pistol overrides everything, you know, and just put everything in that list. Um, but for here, we can just drop down here and we can just override our sphere actor, right? And then save this down. Then I think that's the end of the video. Yep, cool. Dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> and now we have one that's supposed to be overriding the other. And there's now two pieces to it. We're going to look at one of them. Um, one of them is, how do I say I want this mod active? And we'll show that in the menu in here in a little bit. The other one is, once the mod's active, how do I, without altering engine code, how do I ensure that the appropriate thing gets in the appropriate spot, right? Uh, so I added a function called um, get override for class. And in our example map here, we have spawn cube actor and spawn sphere actor. And they're going to spawn in those specific locations, just using the level blueprint for um, you know convenience here. But you'll see, I can get this UGC registry uh, class here, and then I can pass in a class that I'm trying to spawn into it. And if there is an override registered for that cube actor, it will return the other class. But if not, it'll just pass cube actor in. And so you can see the same thing kind of over here with um, our. I think it's the, the sphere actor if I go over to it. So now I've made one replaceable and the other one a replacement. I just need my menu now to say, hey, make this override active. And then this function call will return the appropriate class and spawn it. And all this stuff is also in the documentation too. So if, if you're looking for more information on that, you can. Now, one thing I wanted to call call out real quick back here. Um, this is a couple of extra nodes, right? Like anytime you'd want to spawn something and there's a, so there's a little bit of extra extra work to do in that place. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you may even take this further deep into the spawn code, right? Uh, as opposed to having this in every blueprint that you want to spawn something, just do this quick check. Um, I believe the checks are pure, so they should be pretty f faster. They're all in the C++. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, you might want to, for performance reasons, again, if you're comfortable working in engine code, do this down in the spawn code as opposed to up here. Um, that way you can you kind of do it more globally if you'd like. Other side of the coin, though, this is kind of nice, and it was really nice for Robo Recall because it gives you really fine control over the things, again, that you can actually mod in the game. So not only do you have the ability to say, okay, all Sphere actors are moddable, but then I could build a world where, like, I have to have a sphere actor over here, or I have to have this enemy here, or I have to have this building. It has to be this building that the game falls apart for some reason. You can just say, okay, override those, but not this one. Like, this one has to ignore overrides, so you don't do that. A good compromise between the two would probably be working into the spawn actor code and have a checkbox, you know, that you can just turn on, turn off to say, hey, allow overrides or not. Um, but again, a lot of that would require a lot of engine code. Um, and that wasn't really, it was outside of the scope of this, so we didn't want to 
have everybody here having to go through and make you know significant changes to some of the core functional pieces of uh, of, of tech here. <clears throat> okay, so let's get to the end of this, and then one more here too that we want to take a look at is the pawn itself. Um, so since you don't spawn your pawn anywhere, uh, you kind of have to work this in a little bit differently, and. I've opened up my game mode here. Game mode kind of you know picks your default pawn and it tells it what to do. Um, you can you can override the function get default pawn class for controller. Uh, it's already available in, uh, as an override to blueprints. Uh, I would drop it down over here, but I've already added it so it doesn't show up in the list. But if you're not familiar how to do overrides, you go over to your functions here. And there's a little drop down that says overrides. You can see right there. Yeah. And so you click a, that and you what's that? We done a live stream on that as well. I can oh go great, ahead and perfect, it. perfect. And then so in here, I just do the same kind of thing. Uh, the D get default pawn class for character spits out a U object. So I cast, or, sorry, U class. So I have to cast it an actor class, make sure it's an actor class. And then I'll do a quick look up and then return. Hooray. <clears throat> and now on the first thing, on the first, um, uh, sorry, for spawn actors in the world, not the pawn. Some of you may be asking, um, what about things that are placed in the world? And those are a little bit different. Uh, there's a couple of ways to approach that. And I worked a couple of different methods in here, but I couldn't get something that was, again, uh, really nice without changing engine code. Um, so first and foremost, I would encourage you to spawn when you can. If you have to, if they have like thousands of things, amortize those over time. Um, the fastest way to do, the, 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 the appropriate way to do um, actor replacement for spawned actors and or for play, actor replacement for place actors in a map would be to do that like in the level loading code. So when it goes through to construct itself, it would need to rebuild everything, and it would build the appropriate thing the first time. What we had to do for Robo Recall um, was everything spawned in Robo Recall, all, all of the enemies, the, the weapons, um, anything that we wanted to have modding spawned, except for the actual boss. And the boss had to be placed in the scene um, because something was strange with timing when cinematics came online to start showing the boss. I couldn't get the rotations right if I were spawning him in. And so what you can do is, for those specific cases, um, you can do a post-load lookup where it's got to look up into the game instance in the sky and understand if it's supposed to be what it is or not. Um, so I think what that was is like we just said, hey, get my class type and then do a quick look up. If I'm the wrong type, or if I'm supposed to be overridden, go ahead and spawn the override, assign my properties to it, and then assign anything that's referencing me to that new thing and then destroy myself. And it wasn't too big of a deal. Um, it's more pain that you want to go through, though, for sure. And um, uh, so I, I would discourage you from, from doing that and, and these kinds of things that will be, be a little bit more dynamic. And then let's go ahead and test the replacement. So we've now built our metal ball. It has a replacement actor component. We have our sphere actor. It's made replaceable um, by all other actors. So we pop back into our main menu here. We can go down and hit play. And then now you see, here's, here's what I was talking about in the menu. So I've got actor replacements. This apply button is going to call a function called reg register override for class. And it patches in uh, and it. And it and it registers the replacement class. It goes through and it tells the other to, hey, now you're supposed to be me. So if I go ahead and apply that here, I added into the menu the ability to kind of see what overrides are there. That might be a little bit blurry for you, but it says Sphere Actor C replaced by Metal Ball C. And then Clear Override just kind of um, removes that. Those are just held together in a T-map right now, it's just because it's an association between the two classes. Um, but feel free to extend that if you need more information about it as well, or more information stored with it as well. Um, so yeah, let's do that. And I can hit open map here, and you'll see we're taken to the main level, and the silver ball is now in that spot instead. And it falls to the ground. We have a we are overriding the base game, the exciting, fun UGC example game. <clears throat> All right, so let's actually take a look at that if we were to package it up and go, right? So first off, I'm going to hop back over to my desktop, and I'm going to remove my mycoolmod.zip. Um, I just want to call this out uh, just as something that we did here, just so you don't run into it and get frustrated with me, which you can do that too, and then you can give me feedback. I'm happy to hear it. Um, but I left this, uh, I left the code in there that 
if you're trying to package a mod and put it into a directory um, and it already exists there, it actually fails. And it'll give you a failure um, failure reason inside the, the output log. But basically, you want to delete this or move this or rename this zip before you do it again. Um, what we didn't want is for you to unknowingly be clobbering things uh, if you had multiple versions of something that you're trying out, right? So it just kind of forces you to to move that around. Um, you're more than welcome to take that code out too. I won't feel bad. But I'm going to go ahead and delete it here. And then we're going to package up this new one because my cool mod, which is the best mod, has uh, this new replacement ball in it. And it has uh, this map in it too, right? And you'll see too, like this stuff, process is pretty quick. We're not doing a ton of stuff here, but if you're doing a small scale iteration, uh, you can do a lot really fast, right? So that's already done. And we're going to go ahead and pop it open. And for clarifications, because that was a little bit blurred there, you click the package UDC, UDC button at the top of the toolbar, right? That's right. That's right. Just went through the same package flow as before. <clears throat> so I can hop into package UDC, when it's an editor, back into my mods directory, and then paste that in there. Going a little fast here, but it's things you've already seen. And now I actually have my metal ball inside my core game. So this is, again, packaged game. And now I've got a new actor that's overriding the actual main game. So now we've actually built and shipped to my desktop a real mod to UGC example game. Um, so yeah, let's just take this one step further too. Like I was just going to see like, okay, great. Well, in the push to get, you know, an entire other game side loading into the game, right? Uh, I was like, what if I just built a whole template as a mod, right? So I'll go through this kind of quick here, but um, I'm going to make a new mod package here and let's call it template as mod. And we're going to try to sideload the entire third person project in uh, to see what we can do with that, right? I'll get that up and running. Third person project, but load it up as a mod. GEGC example game. All right, there it is at the bottom. And then I'm going to add new here. I'm just going to import this content pack for third person. Um, this is kind of a fun. This is a, a a workflow that that you know I wouldn't recommend doing this specifically, just because I can't add the third person template straight into a a mod plugin folder. It's going to drop into content, so I'll have to migrate it here in a second. Um, so you can do this if you'd like to. Just know that that's you can't get it straight into your mod. You've got to do this and then grab geometry mannequin third person third person. But it's still fun to do. Move these on down. I say copy here or move here, even better. And I know it'll tell you it's cleaning up old assets, loading some things and saving packages, but you'll still want to go, if you do this, go back up to content, fix up redirectors, where it is, there it is, just to make sure everything is referenced appropriately, found appropriately, um, and you're not going to get any weird um, you know, errors there. So now I'm going to come down here, now that I've fixed up, just to resave because I'm paranoid. Uh, now I've got the entire template as a mod. So let's just see if I run it, what happens. All right, so now you can see Templates Mod is another mod package over there. We can pop open the template, and as expected, we've got third-person template working in the, in the game, too. So, <clears throat> And now, too, like, so let's take it one step further and say we wanted our third-person character to be the player, the player pawn inside our example game, right? So not only are we just making a new game as like a full conversion separate thing, we also want to override the pawn in the main game too, right? So we're going to pop into our blueprint here. We're going to add a component or make or just sorry, replacement component. That's right. And then we just need to make sure that the let's find out what our pawn is. So let's just make sure that it's in good shape. So blueprints, game plan framework. UGC example pawn, and let's make sure it's got a it's got a make replaceable actor on it. Great. Um, then we can go back to our where are you? There you go. And then actor classes to replace. So we'll just say UGC example pawn. Bingo. Play save. And then play. All right. So now we have that replacement as well. We can apply that. And oh, you know what? Hooray! He's in the game. So one more thing we want to try here as well is we can mix and match these mods too. 
Um, you'll see now in the overrides, I have Sphere Actor and UGC Example Pawn. Uh, so we supported this for Robo Recall too. It's basically, we want you to be able to turn on as many mods as you want. Um, doesn't matter where you got them, as long as, you know, they're not, they're, they're compatible enough, right? Like you've got this, them structured well, where they're trying to override the appropriate things. If there's contention between two things trying to override uh, the same thing, the last one done one because it's just a team app. Um, we did that so we could do kind of like a, you know, a, a mod priority list inside Robo Recall where we would apply them from the bottom to the top. So that's one of the top took priority. Um, but we can hit open example map here. And now we have our, we're kind of building a soccer game with a big metal soccer ball, um, completely out of band. We can go ahead and package that up too. Drop that on the desktop. <laughs> Every tech never wait because redirects can be a nasty mess. Yes, they can. Always fix them up. All right, so I'm going to move my uh, my templates mod into my mods folder here. So now I've got two loaded up, and then pop open UGC example project, and I can just let's go ahead and apply all from all sides, and then boom. So now I've got a brand new cooked packaged. Um, distributable mod for UGC example game. Like I could take this right now, these zips, and mail them to any of you that have this um, UGC uh, example exe the the project, and you could play these if you wanted to, right? So like if you get get some cool mods for the project or whatever, you just mail them to me, and I can play them over here as well. As long as you're not, as long as you're doing it against the same uh, project version. Um, so that's kind of like an overview of the project. I mean, there's really not a whole lot left uh, to to look at there. There's I, I think. Um, like I said, I could dig deeper into the, the UI widgets and stuff, but it's all pretty straightforward um, as far as those go. I'm going to pop back open the this guy here. So we have a few more things to take a look at here. <sighs> all right. So when it comes to actually adding mod support to your project, um, based on the work that was done here, there's a quick start in the GitHub repository. Please read it. Um, there's a lot. It, there's a lot of pages. A lot of it covers what we've already done here, but try not to skim through it too much because there are some important steps as far as um, what you need to do. And I'll cover some of those things here that that um, that are there. But um, I, you know, I worked with this a uh, handful of different folks. We've had tested internally at Epic to make sure it works well, and I built I built it from scratch a number of different times. I actually used the the doc itself as is to add mod support myself to vehicle game, uh, just as a as, as a test to see if it would work, and it's super neat. Um, You'll need to have a source build of 425 one or higher. This is because you have to rebuild the automation tool, um, and you can't do that from the binary. Um, but it's as simple as just downloading it from GitHub uh, and just compiling it. You don't need to change anything in source. Uh, your project will need to be a code project. And that's important because whenever you generate project files, uh, the simple UGC automation scripts, the project will be in your project. and the uh, the scripts, the batch files that go through and look for those things, they'll find your project if it has modules and it'll add those things. So it's really simple to add. All you have to do is just add an empty C++ class and voila, you're a C++ project. You don't need to write C++ to do this. It just has to be that model. And so no worries if you're blueprints only right now. Um, you need to copy the simple UGC plugin over for the function libraries, components, and editor extensions. Uh, You'll have to take a look at the UGC based game instance for the UGC registry object class. We'll take a look at that here in a minute too. Um, you'll want to set up some sort of runtime hooks to integrate mod content into your game. So what we showed today were the runtime hooks of actor replacement. I just put this little you know shunt in there that allows us to to do a quick check before we do something else. But if you're doing something like expanding like a library of like I said swords for a vendor or whatnot. You want to make sure that your game is designed and your systems are designed to take those new things into consideration. Um, so think about those. Think about how you want mods to be used regularly, um, and then how you want them to be discovered. The UI menu I have here has some calls into some functions that can get you some of that information. Um, but you know your needs are not always going to be the same as as what we had here. Uh, you'll need the simple UGC automation CS project. It's just got one simple script in it right now. Um, it's really bare bones. It's built off of the package Odin plugin script that was for Robo Recall. It's just scaled back dramatically because we're not handling a number of other things that Odin was handling. Um, 
you'll need the development asset registry and i'll show you this again too this quick caveat too all of this is in the quick start guide but i just wanted to call it out here too um the development asset registry from your packaged game for packaging ugc so basically what this is is when you release an editor when you want when someone wants to package a piece of content for the editor it has to reference the asset registry from the base game to to complete the actual cook and package so it knows kind of everything that's there and it can come together and the two can work well together i'll show you how to do that in a minute and then seriously though i can't i can't um recommend to go, enough go through the quick start document and even if you feel like you're pretty savvy with working with some of this stuff, some of you are probably way better than me at a lot of this, which I think is great. So if you if you are, go nuts. Um, but I, I do recommend going through and setting up the, walking through the UGC example project as well, the, the walkthrough that we kind of did today. Doing that will help you understand where things are as opposed to just watching me watch videos and click around and talk over a screen. Um, it's, it, it's, it's really healthy. I go back through it too when I get stuck. Um, it, it's a good resource. So looking at these in, uh, specifically here, the simple UGC plugin, you can see this is a screenshot of the, the GitHub. It's under the, the project slash plugin slash simple UGC. You send that to the same spot for your project. Shouldn't be anything special there. Now, UGC base game instance. Um, this spawns and creates our UGC registry object. Someone on Twitter rightfully brought up that this could probably better off be a subsystem in UE. And one of the reasons we didn't do this, like Mike Fricker and I were talking about that, um, but one of the reasons we, that I didn't move it over into a subsystem and I left it here was because this is exactly how Robo Recall works right now, and Robo didn't have that feature at the time. And I wanted, at first at least, for people to be able to draw the parallels between the two if they want to see something that is bare bones and then something that is a lot more robust. They at least have some of the same places to look for some of the same code. Um, that may change over to be a subsystem in the future, but. In general, this is inside project settings, maps, and modes, game instance. If you have a custom game instance, you can easily subclass it to UGC base game instance. Um, all of that's different in there is the mod registry. It shouldn't be any big deal. Uh, the blueprint library that gets the gets the um, uh, the mod registry is just pulling it from the game instance. So if you're savvy in code, you can change that as well too, however you'd like it to be. Um, let's see here, runtime hooks, as mentioned on the right here, because I put these in order, we have how you actually tell things to be registered. And on the left, we have, okay, whenever we're trying to actually use one thing, how do we get at the other? Again, this is gonna really depend on what you wanna do. This is for fun, simple actor replacement. Um, like in vehicle game, for instance, using just this stuff here, I was able to build vehicle games that had multiple cars, that all had rocket launchers, that had life that you could destroy, right? That's really fun. I built that in an afternoon. It was really great, a lot of fun. So you can get a lot of mileage out of this, but it's not going to meet every single use case that you have. So just think about that and how you'd want to do it. The important part here is finding that big new bundle of content, using the asset registry or some of the functions that we provide to get the content you need, and then find way, the appropriate ways to inject them into the systems that you uh, want to be extended, augmented, replaced, whatever. Um, the simple UGC automation uh, project. So this has just got the package simple UGC plugin script in here. Um, you'll probably want to look at you know this and expand it over time. There's probably a lot more you want to do um, with actually packaging a, a plugin. Maybe there's something at the end of this when it's finished. Do a callback to server to send it somewhere to mail it or whatnot um, to name it differently to serialize it differently potentially. Um, it's totally up to you, but this is all there. You'll need to move that over. So right now, this is also under the project. And it's under build scripts. Move that into your project, build scripts. Uh, and then if you follow the guide on the quick start, whenever you generate um, project files for your UE4 project, it will grab these scripts, add them to the automation tool project. And you can just right click and say build, and then you're done. <clears throat> and then the development asset registry. Um, this is something that you don't copy from us. Uh, so don't copy this one out from our project because the one that we have is the development asset registry for UGC example game. Yours would be from your project, right? Um, and this would go into, it, you, whenever you build your project, you can, you can build the, the game.target, uh, build the game itself in, um, uh, in, in Visual Studio, or you can do like a full package, which will do that for you either way. What that'll do is that'll build a saved cooked Windows node editor to your project and give you this asset registry. Um, 
After that, you'll copy the metadata and the asset registry folders from there to your project slash releases, which is a new folder that you'll make, um, slash named release slash Windows No Editor. Now, the release name here is for UGC example game. And then even in our in some of our build scripts, those two things are they're important and they have to match. Um, you'll read in the quick start guide that we I hard coded them specifically for UGC example game. Um, you will want to change those for your own project. And ideally, those are driven by something that comes out of an any file or from your build system, right? Your build system makes these changes and then and then you and then it generates this releases project for you and moves these things over there. Um, we left it as it was for Robo Recall because we didn't want to be too presumptive of your setup. Um, but open to change that in the future uh, as we find how people are using this and um, you know what is probably the, the best use case overall that we can support. Um, putting that into an any probably is the, the appropriate call and then just updating the any every time you up your version. But um, nothing we provide out of the box would generate the releases folder for you um, um, on your end. So that would probably be something that you would work into your build system or do by hand like I've been doing. And then seriously, again, just a reminder, please read the quick start guide. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, and it being on the on GitHub as well, um, if you find an issue, not like a, I, I'm having a problem with doing something, but like some inaccuracy inside this, you can you can tag me on the forums and I'll try to get up there and fix it as, as quickly as I can. Um, but that's the link to it. It's just it's available there too. You can read it on on GitHub as long as you're logged in. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple of further customization things that you might want to do here. And this isn't something, this is out, outside of the scope of the project, but just kind of to be inspired. And you can reference Robo Recall for a lot of the stuff since we did it there. Um, first and foremost, the icons we put in there are were built by um, our editor team, and they're beautiful and we love them. But they don't represent your game at all. When you're going to build and release a mod editor, what you want is you want people to be able to um feel like it's like your mod editor not just ue right like as much as we love ue and how it looks and stuff um you know if you're building like dragon game six this might be like a create new gc and it's got like a you know a dragon that's holding a machete because dragons don't hold machetes um but those kinds of things right work your branding into there uh these icons are located in plugins will be gc resources kind of as, as an expected thing we have both create and package icons as well as the icon here for the base template uh, it's just the U logo. Um, you can replace those two. Uh, speaking of templates, um, you might want to add some. Uh, I didn't add any here since we didn't have any content, and I couldn't really build them in a way that would, uh, again, not be too presumptive of your setup. But if you take a look at Robo Recall, you'll see that we have a bunch of different mod templates that we support, right? So there's like custom pawn, custom this gun, custom that gun, custom empty gun, custom enemies, you know starting points from all the different enemy types. <clears throat> in that templates folder, uh, you know, they have, I think there's a base template that does the plugin information and then it also holds a bunch of assets, right? So when you create these, it copies this over into that mods directory. Um, since it's a, I think it's plugin wizard definition, you can look at the plugin wizard definition code uh, and see what it like the, the the wizard I guess sorry the new plugin manager uh, the new plugin dialog that shows up has a bunch of different templates too right um, so if you want to see how a lot of those are set up you can look at that code and then just start adding your own as well um, but this might be if you're doing like a like I said on vehicle game there might be like a new desert map new snow map new you know new uh, motorcycle new this car new that car and have people have jumping off points so these get moving. And the same thing for splash screen. Um, it's not something that, that is uncommon for us to do internally is to change our splash screen for our editor internally, right? Um, but for mod kits as well, like, you know, we have the editor splash that's just Unreal Editor for people to load. Um, you'll want to change this out for your modders so it feels also just like your, you know, your, your, your special kit that's uh, built specifically for building content for your game. Um, that is under, like, the project path engine content splash. And just change that out, and it should work. Um, so moving on to functionality for other asset types, um, you'll see inside the thing is UGC registry.cpp, if you're comfortable working in code uh, that I added in here, we lean on the asset registry for a lot of things. 
And what we'll do is we'll pass in one of these UGC packages, and then we'll pass in, um, you know, kind of a, an out array of, um, you know, of classes or maps, or whatever the type is that we care about. So for right now, we're just looking at classes and maps here in this library, but it would be trivial for you to go in and copy these things over, change the filters, and then instead of a TRA U class, maybe it's like a U material or something, just to get a list of materials back out of the asset registry. Um, the code's boilerplate enough that the only things that are different here would be the re that return type. Uh, so if you're looking at doing, you know, just material replacement on specific things, um, this is, would be a way you could get all materials in a certain package. And then also too, saving user preferences for mods they have enabled. For Robo Recall, we didn't allow you to do class by class overrides. You could just enable an entire mod or disable an entire mod, right? And we, like I said, we had the a prioritized list of mods. So when I enable one, it adds it to a list, you know, and I can move them up and down. When I hit apply, then it goes through and does all the applications bottom to top. What we wanted when people came back into the game to play after a session um, for their mods, uh, the mods that they had chose to be on, to still be on, unless they were, um, you know, deleted or something, we would, you know, remove them from the list. But you can take a look in here in Odin Blueprint Library. Again, the source is available with Robo Recall Mod Kit from the Epic Games Launcher. Um, you can pull this stuff down specifically from there. And this may be something too we bring into the to the game, uh, to, to the, the sample at some point too, because I think this is really, really nice to kind of remember where you are when you play, um, especially as you know, you might have 100, 200 mods in a project or in a game. But you can take a look here to see how we save player enabled mods using the UE's, uh, UE4 save game system, and then how we load that back and then you know, use that to repopulate and then reapply all the mods. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for Q and A, right? I, I, I can probably shut down here in about maybe fifteen or twenty or so, so I can answer some questions. Twenty minutes, all right. Let's go because we got plenty let's of questions. Let's do it. Okay, great. One of the uh, first. Oh. Yeah, let me. You, you want me? Do you want me to just hop in the list or? Um, I, I was I was going to compile some of them into more generic ones. We sure. Just talk yeah, about go, a little go bit, for it. A little bit broader. Go for it. Um, go for it. Some of the discussions in chat that happened throughout uh, the stream was sort of the process of providing this for the end user, right? And a little bit of confusion in regards to um, which editor will you be providing and, and sort of how do you package that up? And so perhaps just uh, talking a little bit about what the this process will look there. Like, the process there, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as you've probably seen, there's a number of different mod kits that are available on the launcher right now. Uh, if you want to release your own version of Unreal Engine to uh, your your community, um, it would have to be the, the the way that you the way that you release Unreal Engine re-release uh, redistribute Unreal Engine tools um, would be through GitHub or on the launcher. Um, some people have opted for GitHub because they do a lot of uh, code changes, and they want to do things, you know, really quickly, and you know, I'll, I'll always have the latest available, and take pull requests from the community as well, like having their project almost end and open, right? Um, GitHub in general is a little bit more cumbersome because, as most of you all know, large binaries in your project, right, aren't going to really work well there, and so working around that it can be a little bit of a pain, and in general, a poor user experience if you someone has to compile like an entire editor. So, um, prepping an editor for release. Um, depends on the sophistication of your build system. If you don't have a build system, you would be doing some of these things by hand. Um, but what happens is you reach out to, to somebody on our team, you know, like either Victor or Amanda, they would probably get you in touch with me um, whenever you're ready to release. And then we would um, start the process of getting of, of getting the tools set up to be chunked in and, and sent to the launcher. So there's, just a, there's some simple paperwork that just makes sure that your IP is protected. Um, and you're saying that we can release your project there, and then you kind of have a tool that can allow you to just up, update it and send it out as you have updates to your game. If we uh, take it back a little bit, you know, obviously pushing sure. you know something to the launcher that can be a a, a rather big thing, right? And uh, mm -hmm. not every team might be ready to do that immediately. Um, the process of sort of being able to say, perhaps you just want to test it. So say you're, you know, you made a game for a game jam and just for fun, you wanted, you know, others to be able to, to mod this game. Uh, what would yep. the process for the end user be then? Yeah, sure. In that sense, if you're working from like a really core vanilla version of UE and you haven't made any engine changes, it's probably not a whole lot different than just giving them the plugin and then giving them, like having them work through this stuff and then giving them your project, right? Right, so they need the project, right, of yep. um, that you were working on, and then that's right. They would need to go through the process of getting 
the plugin compiled so your project would load because you would be using some functions that they don't have uh and then yeah they would need the, the build scripts as well so they could actually package the 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 content for it there was another good question on the same topic um let's see in regards to to publishing this right because as far as i know you're not able to just share a version of of the engine right the only sort of legal legal means to sharing a complete custom version of your engine the only two i think you mentioned it's github and the launcher right and that's so right that's right you can't just sip your engine up and, and sort of send it off to someone um unless they're on your team and you know they're under the same licensing terms right um Th that is correct so a good thing to note there um so that we don't start seeing uploaded versions of <laughs> just flying around on on github that isn't uh connected to the epic games organization that's um, right and and coming through the launcher too let's lo that allows you to set up a eula for your users as well too, right right so you can protect your own ip when it's out there in the wild now i know some of you especially um a lot of you in the community that i've worked with don't really care much about that you're more about sharing than you know um keeping things to yourself but um yeah that's one thing like we we can enforce a eula click through there as well um would it so uh, andre just asked um still confused how this works how do we protect assets and classes but provide access to create new child classes with exposed parameters yeah so there's a couple ways to do that one you can move the assets that you have into um uh into native and then not release your source right so there'd be dlls so you can build everything from there on down um another way would be to uh a lot of different licensees have gone through the process of cooking down specific assets so they don't want people to have access to outside of just the editor itself and then having those reloaded in the launcher say if you uh if you're primarily designing your game in blueprints would you be able to sort of if you plan accordingly and make sure you you're not referencing you know your entire game and in, in like the pawn for example would it be possible to sort of take a portion of the content that you have in your game and submit that without all the other assets that you might not want to share? Uh, yeah, definitely. It, it really depends on what you, what modders need access to, right? So this comes down to like designing out specifically what you want them to use, like to actually build mods from. Um, a lot of times what we've seen, I've seen a couple of people, I say a lot of times, I've seen a couple of people, what they'll do is they don't want you to have access to their game mode or their pawns, but they want you to build up other other things that are that are isolated enough, encapsulated enough that they don't have tendrils into other systems. So they'll just release these things with like the default game mode, right? And their editor. So that none of their game is there, but their their blueprints that work specifically and their custom editor, a custom version of the engine, uh, allows you to still make some of those things as long as that that asset registry still exists. So a good example of that would be your ball, for example, which is just an actor um, mm -hmm. with some properties. You could simply just ship that actor, um, and the user will then download, go through the same process that that you did here in the beginning of the stream of downloading the custom version of the engine, um, installing the plugin, and then actually packaging that out as a mod project or uh, mod files, mod folder. <clears throat> yeah, I think that could work. Mm -hmm. Um, there were some questions if this will ever be included in a launcher build of the, of the engine. Uh, I don't think so. Mostly because, well, it really depends if we can find good ways to, uh, well, uh, wait, sorry, I guess I should ask the question. Are we talking about the project or like, or the plugin? The because pl plugin. So working with the plugin. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the plugin on a binary build. Um, if we can find ways to make the automation tool take some of these scripts, like if there's better ways to more abstractly, um, you know, send send the appropriate command, and someone had a really good idea of that inside the forum thread earlier, um, then you could do that on. We could pre-compile it and send it out for for versions of the launcher that are that are binary only. But the big thing is the automation script, and there's a lot of things in that automation script too that people will like mod developers will want to make custom for their mod kits or sorry mod kit makers moddable game creators will want to make custom for their game um so that's something something i looked into before and that was the that was the big stop gap was there's not enough flexibility here outside of writing those scripts and code and and writing those scripts and code does re require a um uh a rebuild of the automation tool
Well, we, get we can certainly look into it. It's something I, I, I wanted to do that to begin with, and then I hit that roadblock. Right. So. Well, it's cool that it's available at least. Um, we'll yeah. keep working on that. Um, would Let's see. Is dependency possible with mods? For example, mod B requires mod A to work. Yes, we did this with Robo Recall as well. Um, the way that you'd want to do it, it, so we don't have any mechanisms in right now in the library to do that. But what you would do is, whenever like whenever you bring up a module, you would just have to make it check that the other module is there before it makes itself available. We do this in Robo Recall. So it's just a manual step in case you require that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we do that in Robo Recall, but I think that requires code uh, code mods. To be able to sort of check references at runtime, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, also, there's a... <clears throat> the way that I wrote the UGC packages struct, um, what it does is it takes a subset of the plugin information and it puts it there so, so you would want to present that to your user, right? Like, I don't want to put, like, a bunch of the raw data or the this... this um, the the entire set of information from the U plugin inside like a game UI, right? Um, so I made it smaller to where you could just say, hey, there's like here's a name description and then like maybe like a version. Um, you could extend that to actually say requires these other things too, and then put a filter inside your um, inside the find UGC, find UGC packages. Um, for a loop that runs in the code there and say, hey, this requires those things. So you hold it over here. If we don't find those, we can't enable you. And for code mods, and especially if you start modifying the plugin, you would just have to just distribute that in a similar manner on GitHub. Um... Yeah, so code mods are an interesting one. This doesn't support code mods out of the box, and that's done on purpose. Robo Recall does. Um, what we were, What I was trying to avoid here was the fact that sideloading a DLL into any application comes with you know severe security risk, and I didn't want to encourage people to build games that were <laughs> insecure, right? Like there's a lot you can get without it, um, but it is totally possible, and we do it in Robo Recall. So I would say if you're going to be getting that deep into uh, into modding, uh, definitely look at the Robo Recall code for how we do uh, C++ mods because it's a little bit more involved, um, but it is functional. It's just that. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit more of a. It might have become a little bit more of a liability, right? When you're not really you're not really able to to secure those well, and I'm not the expert on security on those things too. So I would caution people that are doing that to keep that in mind. It's a good call out. Um, which platforms do mod support, and are there limitations on certain certain platforms? So using this right now, since we lifted it straight off the Robo Recall um, functionality or the Robo Recall tech, uh, it's working on Windows. Uh, I need to take a look at I haven't tested it on others yet, but right now that's where we are. There's no reason that a lot of these scripts sh wouldn't be um, also applicable on other platforms. Um, I just haven't I haven't gone through the process of, of rebuilding the automation tool to be able to package this on Mac. But I can't imagine we're not doing anything that's that's super you know platform specific here. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all for the most part pretty straightforward. It just comes down to package paths and and, and NASA discovery. Let's see, got a few more. Um, how would extending classes such as this work for classes that need database information such as stats? Not entirely sure if they mean um, remote, so pulling from the web. I'm sorry, can you say again? How would extending classes such as this work for classes that need database information such as stats? Uh, I'm not entirely sure that I follow. I think they might be referring to pulling from the internet, but I'm not entirely sure. We can, uh, if you can clarify that, and then yeah, sure. Feel oh. free to drop in the forums as well. Yeah, the forum thread. So if, if you're new here for the streams, welcome. Um, when it comes to, you know, the live streams will always go up on YouTube afterwards. And if you happen to watch and watch this when you're not live, and you're like, I can't ask my questions. Um, the forum discussion thread, which is also where we announce all the live streams, that's the place where you go to sort of comment and discuss in terms of the live stream. Um, and I'm sure Chance will be happy to jump on there and um, hel help you out in case you have more questions. Now, I said that now. I, I just I just promised that you'll be in. <laughs> that's all good. I think I can grab like two or three more. Okay, that's about how much I've got. Okay, um, great. 
With regards to the get override for actor class, if my game has a multiplayer mode and a client hasn't downloaded the mod, what will happen? Probably not great things. <laughs> uh, so UT solved this problem by ensuring that people before they join the session all have the same the same mods. Um, the UT code, it's funny, we based some of the Robo Recall tech on the UT code and we based this on the Robo Recall code. So uh, I would say if you're working through something like that and you want to make sure that those things stay in lockstep, uh, I would reference the, the UT4 code that's available on GitHub as well. All right, last one then. On performance, it seems possible to design and develop a game entirely via mods. Yes? Sort yep. of a Gar Gary's mod approach almost. How might performance be affected if your game was practically entirely in the mods folder? Uh, you know, I don't think it's going to cost you any differently, right? Like, <clears throat> as far as performance goes, if you were to build it into the same game, you, you pay a lot of the loading costs for getting that, like, a startup there because basically it's just it's extending the asset registry mm -hmm. which is you know making all the things available at that time so once a pack is mounted the content's available so i can't imagine that you would see a whole lot different i haven't really tried to do like an like an entire game i plan on it i did a um, vehicle game that way and it seemed to be the same as before but i'm also running on a machine that vehicle game probably isn't stressing out too much right um i haven't seen anything differently there um a lot of the things we did for uh, Robo Recall, which is more of a constrained platform, right? Because we had to build to the, the the Oculus spec, which was quite a bit lower. And then it had a whole bunch of stuff into it as well, too, right? Um, we did a couple of really big maps and a bunch of a bunch more enemies, like throwing a whole lot more stuff on screen that were not in the original game. Uh, so I think what what we had was the the vr pawn and some of the you know game state things were the only our game mode um classes were the only thing that were running the actual there were only fr only things from Robo recall that were running in that mode and the only things we ran into there was just um uh just because it was it was more constrained was just the um um you know too many things on screen at once or some of the shaders didn't work from the map that we brought in but those were more platform specific and we would have had the exact same problems if they were in the main game and one thing that's interesting too like whenever you're doing these doing this as plan editor like it's it's looking at these content packs as if they exist inside the game and play an editor so if you're seeing similar um performance between one or the other there uh, i can't imagine you'd see a, a big difference whenever it's packaged as well yeah i would probably suggest if you're thinking of releasing um, mod support for your game to probably write up a little bit of documentation that might be tailored to someone who's modding their first game. Totally. Um, just sending them a link to sort of the, the quick start guide for, for the plugin itself and the example project, that might be a little bit tough. And you probably want to customize it specifically for your game anyway. And having a little blurb there about, you know, maybe like note about performance, you know, um, and maybe right. provide them with some resources. And that's good in general, mm -hmm. you know, if you're interested in sort of foster a community that is excited about game development and not necessarily just your game. Um, it could be, you know, a lot of us start started by actually modding video games. Um, and uh, having that little piece of documentation could be uh, a nice or almost required, I would say, for specifically for your game, um, explaining your actors and your base classes of um, and what you got going on in your game. That's right. Yeah, and you can get it really far with just some of the base stuff that comes with UE, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think some of the first mods that I ever built were just taking some simple content from UT, moving it around, and then having different spawns and lights and whatnot as well right and just using some of the, the the core systems for how ut worked and i learned a lot just doing that and you know some monitors are very sort of cut down versions of, of an editor right but this actually allows you to give your your community the full potential of unreal engine um and they can do you know pretty much anything they would like to and also allow them to grow and continue to make awesome stuff now one thing i wanted to mention too that that Victor pointed out when we were first talking through this. Um, there's no reason that you couldn't take some of these same approaches to build DLC for your game. Right. Right. So imagine you have a game that's out there and you wanted to add like an entirely new mode to it, but you didn't want to cut a new client build, right? You could just basically just, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and make a new package of this thing and then inherit the things you want, use it wholly as an internal tool, and then package it up and then distribute it out to your community. So it's pretty cool. It's very cool, actually. <laughs> when I realized that, I was like, oh. 
Um, That's great, one, right? Yeah, because it is one of those questions that come up frequently, and it's not easy to do. Um, this mm -hmm. allows you to actually do that without the amount of work that is required um, with the, the chunk downloader, installer, and yeah, honestly, I, I don't know those steps by hand. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. I was gonna go. But ahead the, and, go ahead. I was just saying at the same time though, like say you had a say you build your game more modularly, and I'd have to test this out to see how it works. But say your game, you build your game all more modularly this way, and you have an issue with one of them, you could just patch that one as opposed to patching your whole game, right? Yeah. This is kind of nice, not having to do a whole client build. All right. With that said, thank you so much, Chance, for coming on. Um, yeah, and, sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, doing it. I mean, developing the plugin as well as. Um, coming on and talking about it here. I uh, wanted to mention a couple of things before we before we go offline. Um, if you're interested in meeting other developers around the world working with Unreal Engine, go ahead and check out communities.unrealengine.com. Uh, as you might know, almost no in-person meetups are happening around the world, but the groups have taken uh, taken this into their own hands and they've started doing virtual meetups on, on, on Discord and other various platforms. So go ahead and check that out. Um, make sure you visit our forums. Uh, there's also an unofficial Discord channel called Unreal Slackers, uh, which is a great place to discuss stuff in real time, ask questions, or just chat with uh, like-minded people. Uh, we also exist on Facebook. There's there's a Reddit, who'd have thought? Um, and of course, follow us on Twitter for all news related to Unreal Engine. Um, if you are interested in becoming one of our community spotlights for the week, make sure you update us in one of the channels on the forums, the release channel, work in progress channel. Uh, we also browse ArtStation, Twitter, as well as uh, Unreal Slackers. Uh, we're still looking for more countdown videos. I have not received any in quite some time. And the countdown video is what we do at the beginning of the stream. It is 30 minutes of development. Uh, you fast forward that into five minutes, send that raw file to us to get it with a logo of your game. We will go ahead and composite that and you might become one of our uh, countdown videos that we sort of rotate through. Um, make sure you follow us on social media. And next week we are going to have Hel Helia and uh, Jeremiah on, and they're going to be talking about uh, how to use control, control rig, um, how to animate using control rig. And they'll be showing off the uh, sample project that is available on the learn tab of the launcher or marketplace. It's one or the two. It's either on the learn tab or the marketplace. Uh, and once again, big up. Thanks to chance chat. Give a big thanks. To, shout out to chance here for coming on, taking time wow. on this day, having a good time That's with us talking about all of this stuff. Um, I think with that said, I hope you all stay safe out there and we will see you again next week. Bye everyone. See y'all.